Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this video, what starts out as an embarrassing sketch, becomes the best thing that I've ever made, but was easily the most difficult project of my life. I guess I understand what you're trying to make. Um, have I showed you the drawings? So I'm not a classically trained artist, but this was the first rendition. Here's the second one. Starting to get a little better here. Basically, this should be drawn to proportion, but we'll have stacks glued up all the way on the bottom and then up the top up here, and then I'll f hopefully be able to carve these into a cabinet because I don't know how to make cabinets. <laughs> okay. Um, and I've never seen anybody try one like this, but someone probably has. Does that make sense? Yeah. For the last several months, I've been saving all of my offcuts and trying to cut them into nice square blocks similar to what you see here. And my original idea for this project was to use all of those blocks in this build and have a truly scrap wood build. However, when I started doing the math, I realized I had nowhere near enough wood. So I reached out to my friends at Gobi Walnut and I said, hey, can I get like 300 blocks of walnut? And kind of chuckled, asked a couple questions, but said, absolutely. So without Gobi Walnut, this project truly would not have been possible. And if you are interested in a pallet of walnut blocks, definitely reach out to them or maybe even better, a big live edge slab. I don't care if I never see another domino. This is miserable. This is what being a real woodworker is like. I don't care for this at all. I'd posted some progress shots of this on Instagram and somebody commented asking if I was trying to build a cutting board, but things just got out of hand. And I thought that was pretty funny because yeah, this is really similar to how cutting boards are made. And yes, things got incredibly out of hand. And my original inspiration for this project was this company I follow on Instagram. I think it's called Mavimat. Anyway, they make this really cool cabinet, but the more I started thinking about it, the more I didn't think I'd be able to replicate exactly as they did it. So I ended up completely changing my plan after this. You didn't figure it out? Originally I planned on just stacking a bunch of blocks and potentially just nailing them in place, mm -hmm. but I don't trust my freehand sculpting abilities. That is not a tusk of any kind. So we're gonna do a lot more glue ups and that'll keep everything consistent. And then we'll just shape those glue ups down. If you haven't heard this rant by me before, this is the worst tool in my shop. I despise drum sanders. I've already cooked a belt. Um, it came loose, which probably is rare, but I don't care. I still don't like it. Um, anyway, I've got to redo this belt, start all over, and probably do this over and over again. Make no mistake, when I complain about how much I dislike drum sanders, I'm not complaining about this brand. I'm not really even complaining about the design of a drum sander. It's just kind of like if you had to clear a field of blackberries with an electric string trimmer, it's not the best tool for the job and it's gonna take you a really long time, but that doesn't mean you have to like doing it. And that's me with this drum sander. I spent all afternoon flattening these before getting ready to glue them up. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised and kind of shocked at how straight and square these blocks of wood from Gobi were. However, these pieces that are gonna form the bottom shelf had a little bit of distortion to them, so I took them over to the jointer, ran a couple of straight edges, and this enabled me to get a nice, perfectly flat, perfectly straight glue up that's gonna really be the foundation for this entire project. I mentioned earlier that most of this project was just kind of figured out on the fly, and this is not audible. This isn't something I had planned initially, but I started to think it was gonna be really hard to get consistent angles just stacking them up and freehand carving them. So what I'm doing here is making a couple of templates and this is just gonna be to kind of hold all the blocks of wood in place during the glue up so at least the angles stay consistent. Anytime I try a project like this and really get out of my comfort zone, I always get a few comments from people that encourage me to stick to what I'm good at. And 
One of the things that I am good at is building epoxy tables and so much so about a year and a half ago or so, I built my own virtual epoxy workshop, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's an online workshop. It's over three and a half hours long, but it's short, easy to digest chapters that gives you every step to building a wood and epoxy table in your home shop or garage. And there will never be an epoxy workshop 2.0 where I try to charge you more for the next version. I've updated this one several times with free additional chapters and the latest thing we added was a free book that comes with it that's kind of the text version of the video workshop for you to reference as you're building your project. And there is a catch though. We are just about to raise the price and I always like to give people a heads up when I'm raising the price because there's nothing worse than you were just about to buy something, didn't know the price was going up and you wait a little bit too long. So if you're interested in signing up to that course, there's a link in the video description. I highly encourage you to click on it soon before that price goes up. I definitely made some mistakes during this build, but having these templates was not one of them. They were the best thing I could have done because anytime you start using clamps or putting some pressure to it, everything gets tweaked and twisted and just a little bit bent askew. And having these templates in place kept everything at that perfect seven degree angle. And I have a long ways to go, but this was probably the first time in this project that I was feeling a little bit inspired because I had kind of sort of built a box. One of the things you don't get to see in these videos is the hours that I spend basically just staring at a project trying to figure out how to do the next step. And this is one of those sections. I couldn't figure out how I was gonna glue up a seven degree tilt without making everything all twisted and sliding down. So here's what I came up with. I have a seven degree bevel cut onto these scrap pieces or these blocks, and then I'm gonna glue it in place with my shelf cut at the same seven degrees nail these pieces in, and now I can apply some clamps to it and it'll stay exactly where it's supposed to. If you've never seen this next trick using a regular plastic straw, I'll be happy for you to believe that I'm the first person to ever think of doing this. And if you have seen this before, maybe they also saw it from me. And if you've seen this before, but before I was born, just let me have this, okay? This next part might look a little sketchy because everybody knows you never make a table saw cut like this. But if you look really closely, you can see this whole video is actually AI generated that I did just to show you guys what not to do. And the way I actually got this cut was through entirely safe means, but I forgot to record it. As I was installing these shelves and these blocks, I still really had no idea how I was gonna carve this all to shape, but Figured that was kind of a tomorrow problem and I'll figure that out later, but so far I felt like everything was going in about as I'd hoped. And this is a parallel clamp flipped upside down. I've never had to flip one upside down, but it worked really well for prying that shelf open so I could put this post in without removing all of the glue. And you'll notice that I was using some of the brad nails early on in this, but eventually I realized that I should only use those on the very bottom pieces because what I don't wanna do is carve into a bunch of nails that I then have to patch. So it, from this point forward, I'm not using any brad nails. It's all clamps, which was extremely time consuming. I basically would just do one layer or a few blocks at a time, add the clamps, and then wait a few hours, do the next section. And I did this for a few days actually. When this project started and even up to this point, I felt like a normal, happy husband and employer with Ilana and Scott by my side. However, when the ensuing carving and sanding stages relentlessly refused to end, I began to feel like more of a caretaker of this project than its craftsman, which would eventually take me to the brink of madness. All of the blocks of wood that I'd originally got from Gobi were cut to 18 inches long. However, I ended up trimming down those original glue ups so they had a nice straight edge to about 17 and three quarters of an inch. So all of the ensuing blocks that I clamped in there were still 18 inches. So I used this Festool oscillating tool to come back, trim them all up and give me a nice flush back. I'd copied this smaller piece of plywood from the original templates that I used during assembly, and to make sure I have a perfectly consistent radius the whole way around, I used the same size spacer that my wood thickness is. And you can see it's actually a different radius, so I couldn't have used that smaller one for both of them, and it'll make a little bit more sense here in just a second. Here's my new larger radius. I drew a nice high visibility yellow line. And now here's my smaller one that I copied from the original templates. 
drew a line there, and this should give me the same thickness the whole way through. You can see right there, about 1.42, and the thickness of the wood is about 1.43. So I don't think I could get it much closer than that. The next step, though, I am not terribly confident in. In fact, I was pretty worried I was gonna ruin the entire project. You nervous to take a chainsaw to it after we spent Days gluing it up. You've seen me with the chainsaw. Should I be nervous? I'm no. glad the camera couldn't see the face you just made just then. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm super freaking nervous. I'm horrible with the chainsaw. Um, but I got lines, so it's like coloring. And you got a little safety buffer there too. Yep. So yeah, no, this is gonna be very nerve wracking, but uh, nerve wracking is what we do. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. It's going well. <laughs> Everybody knows chainsaws are tricky to start. Uh, try that. Almost. Shut up. <laughs> If you are like Scott and wondering why am I taking a chainsaw with very little skill to a cabinet that I have dozens of hours into, it's basically just to save a little bit of time. I feel like it would take me several hours of carving to whittle down this little bit of wood that hopefully I can just trim off with a chainsaw in one nice, easy, straight cut. And that's assuming I don't go past my line, but also get close enough to it that it makes a difference. Okay, how about a review of my cut? You want to see how close I was to the line? Oh, I can see how close you were to the line. I'm closer to this line than I am this line. Okay. Oh, yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> All right. That's something. That was even worse than I thought it would be. But I didn't go past the line. I mustered up the courage to make another cut with the chainsaw, and this one went a little bit better, but I still don't know that I'm gonna be entering any chainsaw carving competitions anytime soon. And after that cut was off, I got back to the angle grinder, which I do feel a little bit more comfortable with, but I ran into a fairly big problem. Much as I tried to bury those brad nails, I didn't think they'd pop up, but sure enough, some of them did. So I'll have to address those later, but for now, I'm just gonna hide them with this center punch and then I'm gonna be able to fix them a little bit later. But for now, I'm gonna move on to the power planer. And this is a brand new tool for me. And of course, it's freaking nice. It's by Festool, which means it's freaking expensive, but it didn't quite do a perfectly smooth job. From there, I actually decided to move on to the hand plane. I don't wanna give any satisfaction to the already arrogant hand tool crowd, but that's kind of fun. Maybe, maybe I should actually learn how to use hand tools someday. Anybody that ever tells you hand tools are fun is a liar. They're the absolute worst. By now the project was starting to feel like all work and no play and so much so that I was starting to have visions of things that weren't even there. These slow motion angle grinder accidents that let me know just how bad things could be if I let my grip slip. But I continued to persevere and just do my best to carve this down and there's a really nice deer couple. I've named them Wendy and Danny and they're always by the house and they always seemed to like me, however, when they saw me this time, they seemed absolutely terrified for some reason and instantly ran off. It was kind of sad to see. It's almost like they sensed something was wrong with me. One of the few good ideas I had on this build was this series of templates. And the idea is I draw the shape on the front, draw the same shape on the back, then I just need to connect the two through a series of carving and grinding. And the carving and grinding was the tricky part. Here's a dish by Cutsaw. Here's the power planer by Festool that I did to kind of smooth out the legs here on the edge. Even broke out the little hand plane to pretend like I actually use these hand tools. Just whatever it took to get the shape that I needed. And 
I will say my favorite tools for this were the Quetzal one. This little dish, whatever you call it for the die grinder, was awesome for these interior curves. And I'll have a number of these Quetzal discs for sale on my website. I really like the angle grinder one as well as this dish. Some of you are probably pretty concerned seeing me get the chainsaw back, but the die grinder keeps overheating and it's the only tool that can reach in there other than the chainsaw, so I have no choice but to continue to improve my chainsaw skills and try not to ruin this cabinet. Based on what you've seen with the chainsaw so far, you probably won't be surprised to hear that I am not excited about having to use it here. The best tool I found for this project by far has been that die grinder and that cuts all dish. The only problem is it keeps shutting off and I don't even think it's overheating. It would only operate for a few seconds then shut down. It's been really, really frustrating. So I really have absolutely no choice but to risk the whole project and keep using this chainsaw. Normally I love buying new tools for projects like this. The problem is all the new tools I bought didn't really work better than these cut saw ones. So I just kept going back to those. And even this manpaw sander that I got worked great for like an hour and then completely fell apart. Scott was just commenting on how defeated I sound. And I like to think that I don't often get to this point, but I'm pretty much fine never sanding anything for the rest of my life. Um, I thought I was through the worst of it and now I realize I don't even think I've gotten started on sanding. There's still gonna be so much more. So I'll spare you a lot of it. I'm gonna send Scott to go do some editing and I'm just gonna keep grinding at this thing quite literally. At this point, this was essentially an out-of-body experience. I was just looking down, watching myself sand. I couldn't feel my hands. I couldn't feel my arms. You genuinely do not know despair until you have hand-sanded a solid wood cabinet like this for days on end. It's like trying to pedal a mountain bike with your hands up a hill. Okay, enough of that, but if you are someone who feels like you do not get enough Kubrick references in your day-to-day -day YouTube viewing, you might want to consider subscribing because I got them and I'm going to keep them coming. Some of the more observant viewers out there probably noticed that amongst these 300 blocks that I glued together, there are a few pretty large unsightly gaps, and I'll show you how I'm going to fix them. And I had all of these offcuts from when I was cutting those seven degree angles, and they're actually perfect because they have a really nice little taper. So Picked a few random pieces, tried to get the colors as close as I could, put a little shellac down to prevent the glue from staining it, then I just wedged them in there, and that wedge shape works so well for this because they just go in until they're tight. These gaps really weren't too hard to fill, and there really weren't that many of them either. I think I had about four or five of these that I needed to put in there. The ones that I was really worried about were those nail holes that I showed a little bit earlier. These ones were gonna be pretty tricky, and I have an idea, never seen this done before, but I'm sure someone has done it, and what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna to try to find some matching wood, and I have a few of these blocks left over, and luckily I have plenty of options for getting the right color, and from there, I'm gonna cut some plugs. This is just a very simple plug cutter. It pretty much needs a drill press, though, is the one catch to having this, and these are tapered, so they're a quarter inch, but they taper within a couple of hundredths of an inch, so they make a really, really tight plug. I used to cut these plugs out with a bandsaw until I saw someone on Instagram just pop them out with a chisel. So now I pop them out with a chisel, and this is where things get a little bit interesting. This is something I saw a metal worker use. It was a way to get a good solid clamp on a curved surface. The the problem is if I tried to clamp a straight piece onto that curved edge, it wouldn't sit flat. So I'm hoping this domed underside is gonna give me a nice flat reference surface for me to clamp this down. And now I'm using a quarter inch bit. And if you're tracking me, here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clamp this onto that curved surface. I'm gonna use a metal bit in that quarter inch hole, which should guide me perfectly straight, cut out that brad nail and leave me a quarter inch hole for the plug in theory anyway. There was a tiny bit of tear out, but all in all, it was actually really, really successful. I made a few extra plugs so I could choose the best color and grain orientation. 
then just a little bit of regular wood glue and that tapered fit works really well because not all drill bits are exactly the same. They might be off by a hundredth of an inch or even two hundredths of an inch, but that tapered fit will just keep going down until it's snug. And to make sure that there's no visible gap, I mix a little bit of wood dust. That's walnut dust and a little bit of oak dust just to give that variation so it's not like a brown ring around the outside. Mix it in there and hopefully when I sand this off, it'll look really good. Even the non-observant people probably noticed this large gap just under those plugs, and that was just a poor glue up by me. So I'm doing the same trick as I did on the front, just a little bit bigger. And there were a few glue spots, so I couldn't do just one continuous wedge. So I had to break this up into a few smaller pieces using that wood dust trick. A third one going in there, and I know this looks bad, but I think this is actually going to work pretty well in the end. Again, adding a little bit more of that walnut and oak dust, and let it set overnight, and we'll see how it looks. That was my flush cut saw from Veritas, which I really like, but I'm yet to find a flush cut saw that actually cuts flush. So I need to come back, clean them up with the chisel a little bit before bringing the sander in. And I could probably have brought the sander in straight from that saw, but I do like to clean it up a little bit beforehand. And here's how those wedges looked. I did a pretty poor job on the color choice of a few of them, but that one looks pretty good. That one is a little bit lighter, but all in all, I think that's pretty good. Although that color was a little far off. These plugs and this strip of wood, I think are gonna matter much more than those fixes on the front because no one's ever really gonna see those when they were so small to begin with. And we did a pretty good job patching. These are the ones that I'm fairly nervous might not look great, especially if that color doesn't look right once it gets sanded down. But got everything cut flush, came back, cleaned it up a little bit with the block plane just to prove that yes, I still use hand tools throughout the whole process. Put some 120 grit sandpaper on there, sanded it down and here's how it looked. Here is the all new Blacktail Studio Damascus marking knife showing one, two, and three. Just kidding, there's three. Not too bad though. And if you wanna get a marking knife just like that one, the second generation is now for sale. We're doing a very limited run. There's a link in the description. This is the part of the project I am most excited about because I have wanted to try this for years, but I've never had the perfect project. And I bought this relatively small roll of copper, which still very expensive. This was like 600 and some dollars, but my idea is I'm gonna do a hand hammered kind of backsplash that fits in the back of each of the openings. So it has this really cool contrast with the walnut and the copper, something I have wanted to try for years, but it was a lot of work. That was a lot. How long was that? It's probably like 40 minutes. Before I ever started this hammered copper project, I did a ton of research and a ton of samples. I had some smaller sheet metal pieces that I did. I looked up online of all the different types of texture there are for these hammered patterns. I was completely confident that I had this figured out. I was gonna do all the panels first, but I thought I couldn't wait any further to see how this looked. So I taped it on the back and tilted it up just so I could see. We got the copper in there and I was real confident I was gonna love this. Kind of looks like crumpled up tinfoil. I don't want to admit I was wrong after all that work, but I don't know what to do. I don't have another plan, but I also don't want to make this worse just because that was the original plan. So Scott, what do you what do you think? First off, does it look like foil? I think it kind of looks like foil. Okay. What do you think I should do? Scott has a lot of really good ideas, but his black plywood idea was not one of them. So here's the next idea, and that is to use a bigger hammer spaced out a little bit more and actually using steel, which I'll use like a black oxide solution to give it a really rich gunmetal look. Hopefully that'll look better and at least these templates served a purpose here. Nobody ever told me how painful these hand shears are to operate. This steel isn't even that thick, but this was absolutely agonizing to work through. One. One. 
Each of the panels took a little bit of hand tuning, either with the snips or this grinding belt here. And you can see that I actually cut a little bit of a rabbit all around the backside of each panel. So all of these panels will sit perfectly flush. Nothing will stick out when this cabinet sits against a wall. Using sheet metal screws here, I'm sure somebody will have a problem with that because I'm using wood and sheet metal. So no matter what, I'm gonna be using the wrong screw for one of the surfaces. But here's what it looks like. And I actually freaking love this. I like the color, I like the pattern but I think we can get it a little bit better. This process is called cold bluing and I've done it a little bit, but don't use me as the resource to teach yourself how to do it because I am definitely not an expert. And how I did this though, is I set these panels out in the sun to get a little bit hotter, got them extremely clean. You need to wipe them down really thoroughly with acetone or alcohol, something like that to remove all the oils from it. Then you just wipe it on with a rag and it's really, really simple and it does happen this quickly. And after it's done, it leaves this really deep kind of bluish gray color. And as I understand it, the warmer it is and the more times you do this, the blacker the finish will be. And initially I wasn't gonna do the backside, but I figured I might as well anyway. It's such a quick process. But what happened is after I let these dry, I let them sit a little too long and I got that surface rust, but it doesn't matter because after that application, you need to buff it with steel wool anyway. And the steel wool remove the rust and leaves that kind of bluish gray surface. And after you get it all buffed off, the last thing you need to do is you need to seal it in with oil. And I don't know if I'm supposed to use motor oil, but it's what I had sitting around and I didn't see a problem with it. And apparently you need to let it sit for 12 to 24 hours. And then that kind of grayish blue will be locked in. If you wipe the oil off before that, you can wipe off that bluing. If you are a woodworker, I'm about to blow your tits off and no, this is not sponsored. This is a UV cured hard wax oil and here's how it works. You wipe it on, hit it with the light or the sun and it is freaking cured that fast. And I don't mean you can handle it, but wait another seven days before exposing it to water. I mean, it is fully 100% cured in like one second. I know for me, this is going to completely change how I finish absolutely everything. I'm still pretty early on in my testing of this vesting oil, so I don't wanna tell everybody, hey, this is the future of wood finishing. Everybody needs to run out and buy this now. That said, it's starting to look like this might be the future of wood finishing because instead of having to wait weeks for sample boards to test everything out to see if it works, you can test these for water and spills in like a minute because you wipe it on, wipe it off, hit it with the light or put it in the sun and it's ready to go. There is one big catch though, is those lights are crazy expensive. And I think that might be what actually prevents this vesting oil from really going widespread in the woodworking community. Those lights cost anywhere from like 500 to $2,000, depending on which one you get. So I do think that's gonna be a pretty big hangup. However, if you live somewhere where it's not raining, you can always just put it outside, even on a cloudy day. I should disclose the vesting did send me this oil at no charge and also sent me this light on loan for now. So I could be at least that biased. And I have been in talks with their USA distributor and I told them that it's gonna be a problem that there's no real good way for everyday people to buy this finish in the United States currently. And I can only vouch for two colors. I used the English brown and I used their pure satin, which is kind of like the Rubio pure. And so those are the only two colors I can vouch for. So he's gonna let us sell those on our website. As I use more colors, I might start offering more colors, but this is the pure going over that English brown. And this is honestly the best walnut stain, best walnut color that I've ever found. It kind of looks like that Zircote color, that Zircote wood it is just a really, really beautiful brown. And their satin is every bit as nice as the Rubio satin, maybe even nicer because you can build multiple coats. I will say that two coats of the vesting gave a very similar sheen as two coats of Rubio. And for a cabinet or a bookshelf, whatever you want to call this, if you like that sheen, you're probably fine stopping there. However, if you want to bump that sheen up and increase the color and the contrast, I highly recommend looking into this N3 Nano, which is just this invisible layer of protection that also increases the sheen and the color of any wood finish. It doesn't have to be a hard wax oil. It can be a lacquer, an epoxy, shellac. Any wood finish can benefit from this N3 Nano. In fact, it's also a very good metal sealer. This type of metal, if left unsealed, would eventually rust, but this is just like a super wax. It will not really increase the sheen or the color of this metal, but what it will do is completely prevent it from rusting. It's a really, really incredible product. Okay, after about 150 hours of work, here is how we ended up. And as a quick reminder, here's how we started. 
and here's how we ended up. And one other surprise. I added hidden lights to this too. This was unequivocally my most difficult project of all time, but I really don't think this is the type of video that's gonna get a ton of views but I don't regret building it because this is my personal all-time favorite project. I will be putting this up for sale if you wanna see a link to that in the video description as well. Also, there's been a bit of debate about what did I actually build? Is this a bookshelf? Is it a cabinet? And every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So start your question or comment with either bookshelf or cabinet or other to let me know what did I just build? <laughs> I didn't expect that much. <laughs> <laughs> what I think? It's my mouth. <laughs> <laughs>